Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this program tonight. My name is Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash Curator at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. The university is located on Kalapuya Alihi, the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people. And we are so grateful that you're joining us tonight for a conversation with Janelle Porter, curator of the exhibition, Helly Ford Fellows in the Visual Arts 2017 through 2019, and three of the artists featured in that exhibition, Ivanta Kabawa, Pat Boas, and Elizabeth Malaska. Um, and just to be very open in talking with you tonight, like you, like many of you, I imagine, we have all, all of us involved in this program have spent our day watching the news, trying to process unbelievable events, um, sort of figuring out how to balance our desire to share the program as planned with you tonight and to talk about our work and to talk about um, the incredible work that these artists have done and Janelle's work as curator of this exhibition while also thinking about um, things that are weighing heavily on our minds. So uh, just to sort of share that as a starting point, um, we decided to go forward with this program in defiance of bad troubling things happening, um, to put it mildly, and we are really wanted to be able to share the work and enjoy some time talking about um, the work. So my thanks to all of our audience here tonight, to my colleagues at the GSMA, uh, to Janelle for moderating the conversation, to the Ford Family Foundation for their support of making this exhibition possible and of the Halley Ford Fellowships possible. And my special thanks to the artists who are speaking with us tonight, to Avantika, Pat and Elizabeth. Um, thank you for sharing your work and your energy tonight, even though we've all had a lot going on um, in our minds today. So. Um, I am going to uh, introduce Janelle Porter, who's the curator of the exhibition, an independent curator based, based in LA who was selected uh, by the Ford Family Foundation, invited to curate this exhibition of 15 incredible artists work. And um, we'll go through some images of the exhibition. And despite um, the hugely frustrating reality of having our museum be closed to the public for so, such a long period, um, we've tried to make as much of this exhibition accessible and available um, online through now a 360 um, virtual tour that you can access through the JSMA website, a one minute exhibit video um, and other materials, uh, including digital um, gallery guides that the Ford Family Foundation produced and artist monographs with incredible essays and images. So there's a lot of great resources available and I'll include links in the chat um, or the Q&A to share that with you so that you can experience the artwork. But we're very glad you're here to experience a live conversation tonight. And um, Janelle, please let me know um, how you'd like to proceed with our images. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Danielle. You can just go ahead and launch into them. Um, people can enjoy pictures instead of my bookshelf, which I think is <laughs> nice, the requisite bookshelf. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we, to amplify Danielle's remarks, we did have a conversation today about um, how nothing feels normal and that none of us, uh, as one of the artists, Pat, said, we don't want to sort of normalize by forging ahead, but also maybe offering to you, the audience, this art break as maybe sort of a prayer for just a moment to say that, um, you know, that art sustains us and we will not let the malevolence of the presidential, the current presidential administration um, keep us from continuing to live our lives. I think we all need art. And I live in Los Angeles where the museums have been closed since March and we don't know when they'll reopen. So we've really been living without and um, though it can seem like a luxury it can simultaneously feel like an absolute necessity to be with art. I, um, and Danielle, feel free to, to scroll a bit, but I, we want you to maybe feel for a moment that you're getting to see the exhibition, which did in fact open in October, but ended up only being open to the public by appointment for um, about six weeks and uh, but what the exhibition is, is a, really a celebration of the 15 artists honored with a Halley Ford Fellowship in the visual arts. Those were sort of three classes from um, 2017, 18, and 19. And um, is really an extraordinary sort of grant, I think, for artists in the state of Oregon. And I will tell you that I had the extreme luxury uh, and gift of being brought to Oregon to do studio visits with these artists. And 
it was um, it was really wonderful. And I the only part of it that turned out to be unfun was sh uh, installing the show remotely and uh, not being able to see it in person um, because everybody worked really hard and the artists were generous and extremely flexible. Uh, I don't even know that all of them had the chance to, to see the show given uh, the way that everybody's lives have been kind of um, completely made chaotic. Um, and Danielle, if you run out, uh, you can go back through again, perhaps uh, I mean, get to the end and I'll be done in a couple of moments. One of the things that I wrote about um, for just the introductory text for this show was the idea that we, the idea of the of unprecedented that I didn't really know in July when I wrote the text for the show brochure that we would still be living in an unprecedented uh, kind of what do I call it moment life era um, and that today is just yet another um, you know really horrific black mark and just total chaos it's sad it's 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 terrifying, but it, it's just not surprising or, and that's, that's a hard thing to say. Um, but, uh, but still, you know, we're living these tumultuous times and it's writers and musicians and visual artists that really do show us how to interpret and translate and make meaning. And um, I think that um, during these sort of months of confinement where you know, museums and galleries and libraries, just to name a couple of things, that I use with frequency have been totally shuttered. Um, the starkness of art's absence has been really profound. Um, in some ways, it, it reminds us of why we love it so much, but it also continues to shake, you know, my confidence in, in what I do every day. And I, I think I share that with so many people right now. And I, you know, and I'm in a, living in a very privileged position. Um, <clears throat> so because of, um, so what you're seeing in these images is just the, the works on view by the artists. Many of the works are uh, recent, which of course we chose these works together and um, with intention, the work, this exhibition that you're seeing is not a thematic exhibition. There aren't guiding principles. There are really sort of threads that, that um, the work shares in common, um, bearing witness, community, systemic injustice, daily lived experience, abstraction, stories we tell, on and on and on. Um, and I think always there is beauty. And today we, um, you know, for better or worse, for that bomb or maybe a little escapism, or maybe it's, it's all of it, we want to talk about sort of abstraction and um, more formal ways that artists work. And I think where I actually prepared this even before today's events really unfolded was that um, that the way that our three artists, um, Avantika, Bawa, and Papoas, and Elizabeth Malaska, the work does um, gear to more formal elements and abstraction and, and figuration and more sort of, um, I, I don't want to say ideas of beauty and I apologize for being a little tongue tied today. <laughs> Um, I hope you'll forgive me, but that we'll see that though those seem to be the most um, uh, on the surface concerns that their work takes us to so many more intricate places. So um, with that, what just to give you like the housekeeping, uh, here's what we're going to do. Each of the three artists are going to talk about their work for several minutes, uh, just you know, a sort of specific body of work where I didn't ask them to cram in the, the years that they have been devoted to being artists, um, but rather to sort of focus on, on this work that we are showing in the exhibition. And then we will all sort of talk to one another. I will ask them questions. I would encourage them to ask each other questions. And at the end, we'll take some questions from your audience. Um, you, as you can see, you can ask them in the Q&A. I will um, read your question and sort of rephrase it as needed so um, that it's clear and sort of address it to our audience members. So with that, um, I want to, uh, we're just gonna straight up alphabetical. We're gonna <laughs> be very um, not hierarchical here and start with Avantika Bawa, who is going to tell us about her work. Go ahead. 
Yay. All right. Thank <laughs> you, everyone. And I will do a bit of a screen share. But before I start, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to the Ford Family Foundation for creating a pulse in the art and heart of Oregon and making so much possible for us. And of course, today I also want to give a huge shout out to everyone at the JSMA in Eugene, and especially uh, Danielle, Paul, and uh, I'm missing someone. And of course, to you, Janelle, for making this beautiful show a reality. In these crazy times, it's stuff like this that we need most. So thank you, everyone. And also thank you to everyone who was involved in the mounting of the show, the shipping of the show, et cetera. So I'm going to share screen and I will begin my um, 10 minutes. Um, again, thank you to everyone who is here today. I know I have a lot of friends uh, Skyping in or chiming in from all parts of the world. Uh, family back home in India who's up at 5 a.m. I think, kudos to them. And of course, a huge shout out to my students who make me want to do and make better work every day. They can be very annoying, but they, they're the ones who ultimately keep me kind of going and uh, with the desire to keep making more. All right, so I am going to focus my talk on a series called The Coliseum, which started in 2015 and eventually led to a show at the apex space at the Portland Art Museum. And that's the image you see on the wall over here. Uh, the interest in the Coliseum started uh, through walks I would take back after Blazer Games, walking back from the Moda Center, just staring at this gorgeous structure that was kind of abandoned and under scrutiny. Um, and also the fact that this was a building that where the Blazers won, won their one and only championship was something that added to the my interest and fascination with it. And I knew I wanted to do something uh, with the grid, with the steel, the pure structure, the formal beauty of the building, which is ultimately what draws me most to it. And around that time, uh, the Regional Arts and Culture Council uh, commissioned me to do two works for their 15th anniversary. And they wanted something that uh, resonated the pulse of Portland. And uh, the answer was easy. I was like, I've been wanting to make drawings of this building, so I'll make one, but I wound up making two. And those are the two what you see on the left. After making those two, I, I was absolutely not satisfied and thus started a three year long journey that is still continuing, where I've been observing the building from the inside, from the outside, in a very realistic way, in a more abstract way, and really just like getting to know everything and every bit of essence that the building can um, uh, resonates. Uh, the show took place in 2018, and I want to give a huge thanks to Grace Cook Anderson, the curator of the Apex space, who had the trust and confidence in me to create a show with works she had not seen. Uh, we had uh, continuous conversations and dialogues and have become close friends since then. And um, I, I, yeah, again, I just want to give a big thanks to her. On the right over here, you see a very traditional image of the building, which forced me to rethink the logic of linear perspective something I talk a lot about in my beginning drawing classes. And it was interestingly something I could finally employ in my own work. And this was done while at residence at UCross Foundation in Wyoming, another residency that was so graciously sponsored by the Ford Family Foundation. And in this drawing, I basically you know, used twine to figure out where my vanishing points were. If you understand anything about linear perspective, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this piece over here is in a little alcove of the apex space, and I decided to place one of my darker, more meditative works that are even more abstract. The piece initially was one I wanted to paint directly on the wall since I work more site specifically, but because of time constraints, I had to create the work ahead of time, and in the process, I started to make a painting, a practice that I thought I had abandoned, but was one that I began to revisit via this exhibition. So what you see on the left is Coliseum Black, one of my first paintings I've done in the past 15 years. Um, for this piece and for any work, I create many, many sketches. I maybe make 50 drawings for any one final piece. And although the work ultimately feels deceptively simple, which it is, um, the way I arrive at it is a very layered and complex process. On the right here, uh, what we saw on the right is our two prints that I also I, 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 that I did at Crow's Shadow, 
which is an amazing print residency in Pendleton, Oregon. And this too was uh, a residency that was sponsored by the Ford Family Foundation. Um, you will see in all these works that the compositions are very similar. And I like that idea of taking something so mundane and repeating it to a point of making it as exciting as possible, or so I think. Uh, what was also fun with this work, specifically the one on the right, is it allowed me to work with stone after a very long time. It is a very traditional lithograph, unlike the one on the left, which is a more contemporary photolithograph. So also pushing different iterations of the same printing process was something that I, I allowed myself to engage in and explore through the show. We're walking through the apex a little further and on the right you see Coliseum 29, which was one of the very last pieces in the show. And this along with Coliseum 29 to the left are the two pieces I currently have at the JSMA. Coliseum 29 was the very last I did in the series and it is in many ways the simplest and I think the purest. Um, and for me, it was fun to start with drawings that were more realistic and representational with a lot of information, but eventually finding ways to constantly distill it to where it became literally a grid and the history of the Coliseum was something and the structure of the building was, uh, was an idea that was more in the background. Um, in February 2018, a few months before the show opened, I did a residency at Skagastron in Iceland. And I decided ahead of time that I was going to continue working on the Coliseum series. And for, for once, it was a little odd because when I work site specifically or respond to a building, I want to be physically around it. But in this case, I was far, far away. So I thought it'd be more interesting to think about the memory of the building and how I remembered it, but also allow the geography of the space, i.e. Iceland, to influence the work. And that's why you see these white on whites and blurry images because I was literally in the middle of a snowstorm every day, not fun. Uh, those white series eventually led to this panel over here called Coliseum White. And it's currently hanging at the conference room of Washington State University where I teach. It even had a ma massive fall, but thankfully it's been restored. Um, Again, coming back to painting through drawing, but not really calling it painting is something that's been interesting and I'm you know, still embracing it. On the right, you see two very similar. Uh, so here, here's a detail of the same, the same Coliseum white. This work was one I almost demolished because um, it's, it's wrong. It's wrong because uh, the Coliseum has 12 panels, 12 rows. And in this one, I somehow managed to miscalculate and missed an entire row. And that was almost led to its execution, but Grace was like, no, there's something honest about the authenticity of your memory and you need to embrace that. So I did. And one day I decided it was too dull and I decided to just throw a splash of yellow. So sometimes the way I work with color is very controlled and very often it is very intuitive and almost rebellious. Like what color will make the least sense in a composition um, and that's what determines the choice I finally make. And this is my second last image. It also gives you an overview of the installation of the piece. Um, although the work, this whole series wasn't site specific per se to the apex space, being a site specific artist, I'm very concerned and engaged with architecture. And I wanted each one of these pieces to somehow respond to what was going on in the negative spaces, in the vents, in, in the shape of the apex and so on and so forth. And also whatever was sitting in front of the work. Um, I worked with the, the install team at the museum and of course with Grace. And I think we had some really good dialogues in making sure the placement uh, echoed and also was in conversation with the architecture of the space. I'd like to end by talking about this book that I created as a part of the series. It's a limited edition artist book uh, that was printed and published through Ampersand Gallery and Fine Books, where it's still available, just in case anyone's interested. Um, the book allowed me to, uh, to do something different in terms of print and uh, bringing text and print together, but also creating something that wasn't an obvious narrative, but more of a, a, a journey that was 
interspersed with image, text, memory, photo, drawing, et cetera. Uh, the book has a fantastic essay by Brian Libby, who I also want to give a shout out to, who was instrumental in helping me understand the history of the Colosseum and every aspect of it that makes it as fantastic as, as it is. Um, and it includes a be beautiful piece of poetry, uh, uh, creative writing, sorry, by Grace, who enjoyed not writing a traditional catalog essay for, the, for a show for once and doing something a little uh, non-traditional. And uh, the book was designed by my dear friend, Martha Lewis, and I couldn't be happier with, with what she did. So that, in a nutshell, is my obsession with the Colosseum, with structures, with grids, with abstraction, with memory, and the process of navigating drawing, sculpture, painting, and printmaking. And with that, my timer has also said I need to stop. And so thank you, and go Blazers. <laughs> Thank you. It is a beautiful book, which I have a copy of. Um, we'll delve more into some of the other history and, you know, the blazers and whatnot. <laughs> Thank you. you. Um, so I'd like to introduce Pat Boas. She is um, next up in our alphabet. And Pat, go ahead and uh, share your screen and tell us about what you've been making. All right. Okay, well, I want to um, uh, echo Avantika's uh, uh, thanks. And I'll say right now that I actually hear, there's a, someone's listening to this in another room and I hear that uh, reverberating a little bit. So person, please turn that down. Um, but I wanna uh, echo uh, Avantika's thanks to the, the whole staff of the JM, uh, JSMA. Um, certainly to Janelle for her beautiful curation under very strange conditions and a huge, huge thank you to the Ford Family Foundation um, for all that they do and keep on doing for um, their fellows and for the Oregon arts community. Um, and, and to say that I'm so honored to be, um, to have their support and to be part of this company of so many fine artists like the two I'm speaking with today. Um, I make abstract work that springs from a fascination with how language works um, because as uh, artist and writer Bean Gilsdor put it in um, a great essay that she wrote on the work that accompanies this exhibition, she wrote, humans orient themselves toward language the way a plant grows in the direction of light. And um, that was one of these great moments when you, you come together with someone who puts, puts words uh, in your mouth um, that, that I find very beautiful. And so thank you, Bean. Um, for me, language is the element in which we swim, um, but my work um, is animated in particular by the way our experience of language um, resides in our bodies as well as our brains. Um, I look at the abstract and material qualities of language and especially, especially the places where it falls apart, where it fails to give us the whole picture. Um, often I've played with ways to interrupt and unsettle information um, gleaned from popular print sources, um, phrases read or heard, uh, and I'm looking for ways then to stretch, see if I can stretch language's limits. Um, in one series of um, essays on the painter Tama Apps, um, and this whole series has become really important to me, um, by writer critic Jan Bervoort, um, who also was brought to um, Oregon by the Ford Family Foundation um, a couple of years ago. Um, he makes the claim that abstraction is the opposite of information. Um, considering that any image, writing, or music can be converted into data and disseminated as data, which is, you know, our universal medium of circulation. Um, opposing abstraction to that, he's uh, saying that abstraction actually, like love, humor, and style, is inconvertible. Um, and it creates a singular experience of suspended meaning. 
giving us something that's not easily processed, something that interrupts that quick circulation of data. Um, this is a quote that I was gonna take out, but since everything was happening today, I, I really wanna read it, so I put it back in. Um, abstraction, he writes, treasures the latencies of thoughts, memories, and feelings as a source that is inexhaustible precisely because its content can be neither instantaneously nor ever fully actualized. Um, its implications, abstraction that is, unfold slowly in what he calls a temporal latency. And uh, abstraction then for him embraces the yet unthought and the almost forgotten. So I wanted to, to just kind of bring this forward as I talk about the works in the show, um, which are uh, three prints um, in an ongoing series called Abstraction Machine. Um, uh, these are the AM prints and uh, the titles, as you can see, AM, FR, uh, the FR uh, refers to the particular print source, um, but they're all uh, AM, FR, and, and a number. Um, in the most straightforward description of these, they're digital photographs of high-end art magazine gallery ads um, from which all the text has been cut away. Um, removing the text, I wanted to bring attention to the beauty of the periphery. Um, what happens to the side of, around the main event, what's happening where the words aren't, what do we see, experience, read when the information we expect has been excised. Um, thinking about Thrawart and his um, ideas about information and data, there's a satisfying obviousness in using a glitzy commercial print source, which is the epitome of the just-in-time high-performance ethos uh, of dominant cultural production that um, Vervoort is railing against in this essay um, to, in fact, try to create the kind of slowed-down singularity um, that that he writes about and that I find really captivating. Um, also this idea of, of trying to make something out of a refusal, out of an excision. Um, all of these thoughts though, and my knowledge of Revoort's ideas came uh, later. Um, and I wanna thank Michelle Ross, um, a, a friend, a fabulous artist and another Halley Ford um, fellow for um, bringing these essays to my attention. Um, this work started out um, much more innocently than what I've been talking about, um, simply because I wanted uh, some color material to handle. I wanted uh, pieces of actual color, not that I chose, but that I found to move around in my studio and, uh, and shove around and looked for material that was close at hand, which for artists, it's very likely it comes from um, those stacks of art magazines that most of us um, have and at a certain point don't know what to do with. So I started tearing out the, the brilliant um, full color uh, ads for, um, for galleries, mostly for solo shows, often for male artists. Um, these ads cost thousands of dollars to produce. Um, and there was something about that action that, that felt really cathartic. Um, and uh, because I just wanted the color, I wanted the shapes, I cut out the text, but I quickly noticed that the pieces singular, singularly, singularly, singularly uh, by themselves um, resembled glyphs and, uh, and got more interested in cutting as a kind of drawing. Um, randomly stacked, they, they, I, I got to all of these wonderful contributions, uh, I'm sorry, compositions, um, I'll go forward here a little bit, that were soon uh, covering all the surfaces of my studio. I resisted gluing them down because I liked this idea that they could be floating and interchangeable and, and could continue to mutate. Um, I've made several uh, um, groupings of prints at different scales, um, but uh, at a certain point, we'll come back here, I wanted to um, 
make them as large as I possibly could to bring them into uh, um, dialogue with painting. And so for that, I was really fortunate to have a residency at the Watershed Center for Fine Art Publishing at Pacific Northwest College of Art and worked with Matthew Letzelter and a graduate student, uh, Travis Lober there to make these large scale digital prints. Um, there are a couple more that aren't in the show that I've got right here in FR10 and um, 12. Um, my time's almost up, so I'm not going to go too much into the um, process of these, but these were, uh, these magazine pieces were scanned and, um, and uh, printed as large as we could on um, their printers. There was a lot of uh, post-production. There were a lot of things that happened with the color that uh, started doing what I didn't expect, um, playing with figure ground, playing with gestalt. Um, and uh, this way of destabilizing um, and, and kind of having the, the colors and shapes do things that we don't expect has something that I've been interested in bringing into my painting. Um, pushing colors forward, pushing them away, um, disallowing a simple perceptual read. So I'm ending with just a couple of um, paintings here um, that um, I've done uh, since then. And um, I'm four seconds over, so I'm gonna stop. Right there. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> You're all so far so good about being on time. I appreciate it. And you know, we, we have more time to talk about things, but um, uh, thank you, Pat. And next we'll hear from Elizabeth Malaska. Uh, Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Janelle. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody in attendance for being here on this crazy night, um, for making the choice to sit here with us and, and look at artwork and, and think about um, the importance of that along with what's happening right now. I want to thank Janelle for this beautiful exhibition, which I unfortunately have as of yet been unable to see in person, um, but I'm so honored to be showing at the Schnitzer Museum with the incredible artists. Thank you, Danielle and Paul and all the people of the JSMA. And of course, thank you to the Ford Family Foundation, um, such an incredible uh, force of support for arts in Oregon. Um, I don't know where I would be without you. So um, thank you, everyone. So um, yeah, so I make paintings and I make um, paintings with figures in them. And um, in terms of making making artwork, I've always been really attracted to drawing and painting the human figure, as is the case for a lot of people when they're really young and start drawing and painting. Um, kids make pictures of other people and of themselves. And the same was true with me, and I just never stopped. The human form really fascinates me on so many levels. Um, and because of the history of Western painting and its overwhelmingly, uh, its overwhelming focus on the figure, bodies, painting bodies is also a means through which I can explore the history of painting itself. And I have a really deep and abiding love for art history. And I'm really interested and also often take issue with how bodies and specifically femme bodies have been depicted through this history. I don't think there's any such thing as a simple straightforward painting of a body. Um, it's a totally loaded subject. Um, it's freighted with desire, taboo, ideas about gender, race, class, how we're socialized, and furthermore, the relationship of these concepts and issues and ideas with 
the identity of the author, which historically has been white, straight, and male. So that's a lot of things to be sort of sifting through. And what influence does the author's position have on the subject and um, on how the painting is interpreted and received and where it lives and what kind of life it can live? Um, and I'm really committed to investigating these ideas, um, both sort of in the vein of tradition and against the vein of tradition. And I um, wanted to go through the two paintings that I have in the exhibition and just kind of really quickly name the things that we're looking at because my paintings, of course, are referencing, um, you know, the the everyday world, but they're not the everyday world. There are, um, I mean, there's the fact that they're paintings, but also I uh, create subtle shifts and um, absences and gaps between our lived experience, our lived lives, and um, the 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 worlds we see in the painting. So I find it an interesting exercise to just name the things that we're looking at. So this first slide is a painting called Controller. And both of these paintings that are in the exhibition are from a body of work that um, was first exhibited a little over a year ago, last November. Um, and that whole body of work is called Of Myth or Of Monday. Um, so this first painting is called Controller, and I'm going to move in a circle through the painting, starting in the in the upper left hand corner. Um, and first of all, uh, where are we? We're in a bathroom. Sorry, my cat is trying to sabotage me here. We're in a bathroom with a, a pink and green color scheme, and this does suggest a time frame, the 1980s. Although if you if you look around, there's a digital TV and a video game controller, um, and they complicate this, the, this temporal stamp. The walls are malachite or wallpaper that mimics it. And so starting in the upper left-hand corner, there's a niche in the wall. And inside this recess is a sculptural torso, albeit fairly abstracted. Though we can decipher breasts, a belly, a vulva, truncated legs and arms, and a neck without a head. There are votive candles illuminating the alcove and the sculpture in it. To the right is a clawfoot tub occupied by a female figure. The tub is unnaturally tilted towards us so we can see the water inside. And the figure rests a steam, steaming cup of tea on um, one knee and her hand and, and her other ankle are resting on the, the tub's edge. Behind the tub is a huge mirror with a thick wavy pink frame and the mirror is reflecting nothing. Then if we sort of turn the corner, we have um, the, the TV, which also looks like, somewhat like an abstract painting, but, um, and that, uh, that sort of inability to maybe exactly identify what it is, is definitely, it was intentional. Um, the TV hangs above a pink marble sink, and on the sink is a, a large conch shell and an empty bottle of prescription medicine. Water's flowing over the countertop, even though the sink is empty. Um, puddles on the floor. There's a, a large dead male rat on the ground. Um, and then a bath mat, a pink fuzzy bath mat with the video game controller and this sphinx cat, which are those cats that don't have any hair washing its leg and behind that is a little table with a telephone and, and a, a, an arrangement of flowers um, in it. So one thing, um, sort of like a huge issue with the history of Western art, if we're thinking about art history um, and how that translates to where we are today um, is naked bodies. Like there is, an inherent imbalance in this scenario, um, especially if we look at the history of paintings and painters, we know that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a male painter and the, the model um, or, or the body in the painting is female. Um, 
So we have, a, you know, male to female, clothed to naked, artist to model. This creates a, a sense of vulnerability of the subject. Um, and this is often exacerbated by the subject's sexualization and or infantilization. So, you know, why do I use nudity in my own work? Um, well, I'm really interested in these tropes of art history. And I think that I can get to some really interesting places if I actually uh, sort of try to inhabit those tropes, but um, from my own subject position rather than just throwing them out. Um, because I'm very, as I said, I'm very invested in art history. Um, although I take issue with, with many parts of it, but it's still, uh, a conversation that I'm involved in. And obviously my work is very connected to um, ideas and, and uh, moments in art history. So um, I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and I think there is something palpably different that I can aim for, for myself as the maker, but more importantly for the viewer. Um, and partly it, it I think as a woman painting, uh, as a cis femme woman painting um, cis femme bodies, I am in a different position in relation to the bodies I'm making than, uh, you know, a male to female relationship. It's, um, yeah, it's a different relationship. And, um, and I'm convinced that, um, there can be a different relationship between the viewer and the painting. Um, something other than objectification can happen, something like perhaps empathy, compassion, identification, merging, all sorts of things where the body we're seeing in the painting isn't something simply other than the viewer. It's something that can reflect us. It's something that, that might blend with us or even consume us. Um, and this is a wildly different dynamic, one in which the, the painting has agency, power, and sometimes power over the viewer. Um, and I work really hard to support this, uh, this destabilization of the power relationship between um, painting and viewer um, through paint handling and composition and the objects and textures and and all sorts of things that show up in the painting. And I think, so um, why do, you know, does it does the figure have to be nude? I think that um, in this scenario, nudity actually heightens, can, can have the effect of heightening the impact of the experience of looking. Um, because the naked body in the painting isn't simply vulnerable and avail available to the viewer, it pushes back. Um, it uses nudity as a tool, and I feel that this justifies um, the the use of the nude body. Um, and I think even the nude body can become something like a weapon, um, something threatening, which is I'm really interested in. So um, this is the the is second. It? Yeah, I'm just gonna say um, you're at ten minutes, and I so okay. but I so I wanted to to shove you along rudely, okay. but I, I wanted you to get this last picture up, and then we can. Um, Maybe what I'll do since you're on screen and the images on screen is uh, maybe start the questions. Uh, but I want to give you just a we just take like 30 seconds to <laughs> sure. To yeah. That. And I, I ran through this so many times and I guess I just I inserted <laughs> a lot of other stuff. So that's OK. My apologies. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll stop there. Um, I think I'll stop there. OK. Yeah. Thank thanks. you so much. Um, I'd like to invite the other artists, if they're comfortable, at least um, turning their their cameras on, so we can, so all the pa uh, excuse me, the audience can see all of our faces, which is always nice. Um, I have to tell the three of you that you, when you, when you're moderating, you're sort of like, oh, I'm gonna, how do I ask the uh, panelists a question that sort of is, you know, thematic and applies to everybody? And I I feel like some of those ideas are there, but I wouldn't, I don't want to shortchange any any of you by um, boiling you down. But something that, um, there are a few things that strike me. I'll try to find the question in here, but um, I'm thinking about the way that all of you um, essentially use symbols in your work or, and, and so, or take images and make them symbols. So um, 
Avantika, you're, you've done this sustained study of this one building. Again, this is one aspect of your work. I know you're on to something else, but the way that this, this building in Portland is a symbol, not only of international style architecture, but as well as of a massive displacement of um, black residents in Portland, which is something that we would need several more hours to discuss, but it's still for the curious there and um, addressed by you as a subtext. Again, I think um, what I'll direct uh, through the three of you too is to talk about um, the symbol as uh, and the work as, as allowing places for us to dive deeper in. Uh, Pat, you're, um, you talked so clearly about how these very abstract looking color studies are really um, bringing to the fore the language, the, the modes of language, and especially of advertising and to be even closer, the insane art forms that we get that are this thick, which are, you know, really just ads. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and yes, they do cost thousands of dollars for, you know, to purchase. And so there's sort of some monetary structures. And Elizabeth, your um, paintings are so loaded with uh, these radical juxtapositions. And yet there's all these like symbols that are there for us to read as codes. And, and uh, those of us with our own experiences and our, our subjectivities will be able to read some things and not other things. So perhaps um, again, maybe we'll just go through this and and Zoom does limit our, our modes of discussion, of course, but Avantika, would you care to elaborate on the ways that symbols play through your work? And if that's not interesting, twist that into whatever it might be. <laughs> um, I've never, I don't know if I've thought of it that way. I, I, I look at it, the work I do very formally, it starts with looking at an identifiable image often, whether it's a building or a structure and then truly trying to boil it down to its pure essence. So in a way, it's maybe moving away from the symbolism, making it as null and void, and then its own yeah, like thing as far Stripping as it out. Stripping it out, which is why the drawing of the Colosseum, this beautiful square building with a very predictable structure and grid sequence is eventually just reduced to, to rectangles. And then you see those rectangles in so many other structures too. And I, I think there's... It, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you think there is breathing space in your work for for those layers, though, to to come back in, perhaps as brought by a viewer? I hope so. And I and I I know the the you know the Colosseum is a very controversial building, and I don't overtly address some of its tainted histories. But what I what I saw was because it was just there as this neutral drawing it created a space for conversation about the gentrification, about, about the game, about the international style, about the fact that this building is, a lot of people want it torn down. So without really giving too much information by just being a thing, uh, almost a non-symbol, I think it, it did what I wanted it to do, which was create dialogue about all of these other aspects and, and the physicality of making. And just to remark on one thing before I move on to Pat, I really um, appreciated that you said that the last work that you made in the in the series was you felt like the purest gesture and it yeah. really shows a sort of artistic process I think that you all um, employ of the sort of like, you know, it, iterations mm -hmm. to, to seek out a kind of core or, you know, purity, which mm -hmm. has so many different meanings, but that like, we're all you're you're looking so closely at something really examining something to try to find essences mm -hmm. because um i mean i think we all as humans in a way try to do that like we're trying to find ourselves and we're trying for others and and i think sometimes art is a tool for that so it, it was sort of wonderful that you're like and this one was the was the one <laughs> yeah um pat uh perhaps you as well can sort of exaggerate, not exaggerate, extrapolate on symbols or the sort of use of them in your work. 
Yeah. Um, well, I think that more than, than thinking about extracting symbols or, or being aware of them as such, you know, when I was talking about trying to bring attention to the periphery of, of this main event, you know, the words that we're reading, the display type, all those kinds of things, um, that I'm, I'm interested in seeing if we can read those as signs themselves, you know, what are the colors, what are the shapes. Um, in, uh, in those magazine ads, you find a certain kind of hierarchy that um, often mimics a human face, which um, surprised me. I guess I should have expected it, but um, you know, since that's what we're riveted to, I guess, even as babies, um, a lot of times I, I found with these compositions, you know, these, these faces coming in that I hadn't really expected. Um, and so I, I was interested in playing with that. Um, and also I think it's, it's taking me, taken me in my work um, a little bit more towards the figurative um, or at least uh, thinking um, a little bit more uh, about those things that we recognize and maybe as symbols and, you know, does this form um, in the way that I was talking about with Bervort um, make us almost recall something that we've been forgotten and then that idea of pushing us to imagine something that we haven't yet quite thought. So that's kind of where I am on that one, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pat. And Elizabeth, I, I um, your work's being sort of most overt that they're overt, that there's just kind of like reading and we have all these images which can symbolize, you know, for example, the, the pink mirror, which references a kind of high design um, that some will recognize and some won't. I almost feel like you have to be a person of a certain age and disposition, but there are like these sort of, um, you know, bombs in there. Like, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, uh, it's such a loaded uh, idea thinking about symbols. I mean, I as I'm sort of trying to formulate my response um, while listening to Avantika and Pat as well. Um, I mean, I think I, I there's a way in which uh, I I think that uh, being awake is. Uh, it's like when we go to sleep at night and then all these sort of weird things come together, but they're things that, that we might have encountered in our days, but our brain is trying to process them. Um, and they, they seem really, it, the dream seems very surreal because the relationship of things is all off as to how it is in real life. Like, I feel like that's something that I, I, sort of striving for in my work like the things that show up in my paintings are uh you know things that are out there in the world but the way that they exist in relationship to each other is um is off or strange and by doing that um the the sort of the power or maybe the sort of symbolic nature of something that we would normally glance, you know, just sort of go over is revealed. And in that way, it, it, it speaks to the sort of psychological depth of what we're swimming in, in our waking life. I don't know if I'm making sense, but like in the painting maidens, there's a Coke can right in the middle of the, of the floor, you know, and, um, I really, or the, the the video game controller in the middle of the floor in um, in controller, um, it becomes a really strange thing when it's painted, you know. And the act of painting those everyday things is a is a strange act. Like this thing that that I touch every day um, becomes transformed and I think that that's one thing that continually fascinates me about painting is sort of the power that it has to sort of reveal that secret symbolic nature of everything um 
and I'm just sort of, that's part of what drives me in, in, in painting and making paintings is like, oh, what's, what will happen if I like put this, uh, you know, this crazy mirror next to a rotary telephone next to a digital television, so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. You know, as we suspected everybody, um, this hour went, went by really quickly and we just only have a couple of minutes. We really should end on time and let people get back to uh, <laughs> the rest of it. But there is a there is one question um, that's come from an audience member and I'd like to share it though. I don't know that we'll all be able to answer. So I think, you know, first one on the buzzer, uh, <laughs> please. Um, but the question is, um, Quite wonderful. This is not, you know, not to be too binary, but maybe it's just because of the day. I see a sort of exploration of paradox in all the works. Simplicity, complexity in Avantika's work, presence, absence in Pat's, and elegance, awkwardness. These are all slashes between these words with Elizabeth. And wondered if any of the artists might like to speak to that. It's a it's a wonderful question. Thank you, Shirley. Who wants to hit the buzzer? <laughs> no, it's a tough one, right? Can you repeat the first part? Well, that it's just a sort of a very binary day, right? It's a day of contradictions at this yeah. question. And they said there's sort of an exploration of paradox in all of your works that this um, audience member sees uh, for Avantika, you know, simplicity slash complexity and, and presence, absence for Pat, elegance, awkwardness. And that brings me back to what we, the panelists, and and you get, we were talking about earlier, which is why I feel having the talk today was important because it's not one extreme. It's it's, and that's why we make like in the toughest times. And yes, it's sometimes hard to just make for the sake of making. But if if you don't make, then you lose lose sight of a neutral ground. So being here today, right now, this past hour and a half, talking to all of you has given me a chance to step away from. What, whatever else is going on. So when I re-enter that space, I've rebooted my brain a little bit. Yeah, that's a really great place to end. And I, if I could add, you know, nuance and truth are, are muscles that we have to exercise. And I know that I look to artists for complexity and we must, we must look for complexity if we're going to sort of see our way through what has been a really really challenging. Um, well, I don't know how long it's been. It's different for everybody for a long time. And, and I think, you know, art just asks so many, it asks so much of us mm -hmm. at the same time that it allows us to revel and, and take pleasure in it. And um, I can't thank all three of you enough for doing this today, our little wrestling match that we had with like, should we or shouldn't we? <laughs> but um, I, Myself enjoyed it very much. I'd like to thank everybody at the museum and at the foundation, Ford Foundation. And I want to turn it back over to Danielle to, to see us out of our time here. Well, um, and a huge thank you to you, Janelle, because a um, year and a half, two years ago, when you and I started talking about this project and you were talking with the artists about the project and planning studio visits, uh, none of us could have imagined how things would have played out. And I'm just so very grateful for everyone involved in the exhibition, for your flexibility, for your understanding, for your resilience, and for sharing with us tonight. So um, I hope that everyone who's listened in has a wonderful rest of their evening. Um, find some peace and joy in your evening. And um, thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs>